This is going to be our screencast for chapter 20 and what we're going to do in chapter 20 is we are going to be looking at a very rapidly growing area of science which is called biotechnology. Now when you think about biotechnology oftentimes the idea of genetic engineering comes to mind. So when you think about genetic engineering, what that means is you're basically directly manipulating the genes of an organism. Now, of course, those genes are going to be found on the DNA of that organism. Now, when you use the phrase biotechnology, the idea is that we manipulate those genes for what we would consider practical purposes. So then you have to think to yourself, well, what practical purposes would we need to actually manipulate the genes of an organism? Well, for example, when it comes down to disease, there have been quite a few different vaccines that have actually been created using genetic engineering. We could also think about crops, for example. There have actually been quite a few crops that have been produced through genetic engineering to help increase the yield of that crop. Then what you could also think about is you could think about maybe the creation of various different biofuels. And remember that those biofuels could be a very efficient form of energy. And if you can create these biofuels, maybe you could actually reduce CO2 emissions in the environment. So there's lots of different practical applications when it comes down to this area of science. So the whole idea of being able to manipulate genes is really an important area of science, but what we need to be able to do is we need to be able to take that DNA and make lots and lots of copies of it. So the area of science called cloning is really important when it comes down to genetic engineering. Now what we've discovered is that we can actually use bacteria to clone DNA. Now, bacteria are really important in this area of science because if you look right down here, this is an example of a bacterium. Now, remember, bacteria are prokaryotic cells, so they're extremely simple when it comes down to their structure. But if you look at the genetic material of a bacteria, they actually have two sets of genetic material. They have one called the bacterial chromosome, so they're going to have a single strand of circular DNA but they're also going to have a much smaller um, area that also contains genetic material and this is going to be called the plasmid of the bacteria and that's what we're going to be working with. So gene cloning is going to involve using the bacteria itself to make multiple copies of a gene and produce the protein product that we're interested in. So over here on the right this is going to be a diagram that's going to illustrate the process and of course over here on the left are the three basic steps when it comes down to cloning that DNA. So over here on the right again, if you look at number one, the very first thing that we need to do is we need to find a way to actually insert our gene of interest, which is this right here, into our bacteria plasmid. And we'll look at the steps of actually doing that in the next screen. So once we have our gene of interest and we have incorporated that gene into the plasmid of that bacteria, what we need to do is we need to get that plasmid back into a bacteria. So we have various bacteria out there that have been basically engineered to accept these plasmids. And so this would be considered a recombinant bacterium because it actually has the plasmid with our gene of interest. And then in step three, what we need to do is we need to be able to grow multiple copies of that bacterium with the recombinant plasmid. And then if you notice down here, these are going to be our multiple copies. And so hopefully they're going to produce the protein that we're interested in. And then, of course, we can do further research and decide how we're going to use that particular protein. Now, in the previous screen, we just looked at the three basic steps of um, cloning that DNA. But in order to clone that DNA, again, what we need to be able to do is we need to be able to insert that DNA into the bacteria plasmid. And so what we're going to use is we're going to use special enzymes called restriction enzymes. And so these restriction enzymes are going to act like scissors. And what they're going to do is they're going to cut the DNA molecule at very specific DNA sequences. And we call these restriction sites. And so over here on the right, this is going to be our DNA which you see right here, and you're going to see an arrow here, and you see an arrow here. And so what we're going to do is, or what the restriction enzyme is going to do, is it's going to cut that DNA right about here. And a restriction enzyme will usually make actually many cuts, and so we're going to have lots of different restriction fragments. And so once that cut is made, you end up with something that looks like this. Now this is really important because we need to have a cut that's going to allow us to be able to insert that um, gene of interest into our DNA, in this case the DNA in the plasmid. Now these are going to be considered sticky ends, and so if you notice, they're kind of, in a way, kind of fragmented. Now they're sticky ends because when you take this gene of interest, and again it's been cut with the same restriction enzymes, what's going to happen is they are going to fit perfectly within that strand of DNA. 
And what we're going to use is we're going to use a special enzyme, and this is one you've seen before, called DNA ligase. And once that DNA ligase comes in, it's going to basically glue that um, particular gene of interest into the DNA fragment. And so then, of course, our final product is going to be the original DNA with the inserted DNA of our gene of interest. As I had said, there are quite a few steps when it comes down to actually getting that gene into that bacteria plasmid. Now, sometimes we're going to use a term called a vector. And the vector is going to be the DNA plasmid that we're working with. And the reason it's called a vector is because it's going to carry that foreign DNA, in other words, that gene of interest, into that host cell, and it's going to be replicated there. Now, again, we just looked at the basic steps, but when you look at it in more detail, there's actually quite a few more steps that we need to think about. So these are going to be the complete steps of getting that gene into that bacteria plasmid. So like we had said, we're going to have our genomic DNA, our genetic DNA, and a bacteria plasmid that are going to be isolated from each other. Now, the reason they're isolated is because we're going to expose both the genomic DNA and the isolated plasmid to the same restriction enzymes because we want the same cuts to be made. And so in step three, what we're going to do is we're going to take the genomic DNA and the bacteria plasma that has been cut with the restriction enzymes, and we're going to mix them together. And then we're going to add that special enzyme called DNA ligase. And again, the reason for the ligase is to bond those fragmented sticky ends together. And step four is we're hoping to have recombinant plasmids that now contain the DNA, in other words, that gene of interest. And so what we're going to do with that DNA mixture is we're going to add it to the bacteria. And again, these have been bacteria that have been genetically engineered to actually accept the new recombinant plasmid. And so these bacteria are going to be plated on a type of auger, and that auger is going to select only for the bacteria that have the recombinant plasmids. And our hope is that the result is going to be the cloning of many, many DNA fragments that definitely include that gene of interest. And one more time, this is just a good example of what we've been looking at. Again, the insertion of that gene of interest into that plasmid. And so again, we have our bacteria cell here. This is going to be our plasmid. This is going to be our gene of interest, which is going to come from a hummingbird. And these are the um, plasmids that have been exposed to the restriction enzymes. And of course, we have exposed that particular gene of interest, again, to those restriction enzymes. And so we're hoping to incorporate that gene of interest into that plasmid. This is considered our recombinant plasmid because it definitely contains our gene of interest. But if you notice, we also have some other plasmids that did not recombine. And so these are considered non-recombinant plasmids. So then, of course, once we have the plasmids, we're going to take those genetically engineered um, bacteria that are going to be pre-programmed to accept those plasmids. And then we're going to grow those bacteria onto a nutrient auger plate. And that plate's only going to grow those that have the recombinant plasmid. And our hope is we're going to get the production of many, many copies of that bacteria with that recombinant plasma. Now, sometimes what we need to do is we need to get many, many copies of that DNA. And so what we're going to do is we're going to amplify the process. And we have a special process that we use called PCR that's going to help us do that. PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. And this can produce many, many copies of a specific targeted segment of DNA. Now, it has three basic steps. It has the heating step, the cooling step, then, of course, the replication step. Now, over here on the right, this is just a really quick diagram that illustrates the process of PCR. If you notice up here, we're going to have our target sequence. In other words, that's going to be our gene that we're looking for. We're going to denature the DNA, because remember, it's double-stranded, so we need to unzip the DNA. So these are going to become our template strands. We are going to cool it down a bit, which means that it's going to allow the primers to be inserted. And of course, the primers are there to begin the replication of that DNA. Then we're going to go ahead and add those new nucleotides, and this is going to be considered our extension phase. So at the very end of our first cycle, we started with one, but now we have two. So we're going to repeat the cycle, and hopefully we're going to unzip these two strands. And again, we're going to do the same exact process. And so those two actually become four. And then if you notice, we're going to do the cycle one more time, and those four are going to become eight. And so we can actually repeat this cycle hundreds, if not thousands, of times. And that's going to allow us to produce an exponentially growing population of identical DNA molecules that we can work with. So one thing DNA technology has allowed us to do is it's allowed us to study the sequence, the expression, 
and the function of a gene. And there are several different techniques that can be used to actually analyze these DNA fragments or the DNA of these genes. Now, one indirect method of rapidly analyzing and comparing the genomes is using a process called gel electrophoresis. And you can see the apparatus right over here. So this technique is going to use a gel as a molecular sieve. In other words, it's going to strain those nucleic acids or possibly those proteins. And it's going to strain them based on size. And so over here on the right, you're going to notice that the tray itself is here. Um, inside of the tray, what we have is we have that gel. And it actually is attached to a power supply. So we have the negative region over here. And we have a positive region over here. Now this is really important because when we add our samples of DNA to each of these different wells, these samples of DNA are going to travel in this direction of this particular gel electrophoresis apparatus. And as they travel, they are going to be separated according to size. Now they're going to travel this way because actually nucleic acids are negatively charged. And so they're going to want to travel this way and actually approach the positive end of the apparatus. But as they travel, again, we're going to strain or basically separate these nucleic acids or proteins, and we're going to base this on size. And so the ones that are relatively large are going to stay right around here, and if they're a bit smaller, they're going to travel a little bit further through the gel and actually end up up here. And so that's going to give us a pattern on this gel, and we're going to be able to use that pattern to analyze the DNA that was in our sample. Now, with gel electrophoresis, oftentimes we will use restriction fragment analysis. So this is the idea that we had talked about earlier, using restriction enzymes to create lots of DNA fragments. And again, what we're going to be able to do with gel electrophoresis is we're going to be able to actually separate those fragments based on size. And so restriction fragment analysis is going to be very useful when you're comparing two different molecules. And a good example of this would be two alleles for the same gene. So if you notice down here, this is going to be allele number one. This is going to be allele number two. And if you notice, they're exactly the same except for a base sequence change right here. Now, after we go ahead and run the gel electrophoresis, you're going to find that the banding pattern that we have for these two alleles is going to be a bit different. And so again, we can do some analysis. We can make some comparisons between these two alleles that are found on this gene. Now, we can also use this um, particular procedure to prepare very pure samples of individual fragments of interest. In other words, maybe those fragments that we would like to do further study on. Now, another method of analyzing DNA is something called the southern blotting process. And what this is going to do is it's going to combine gel electrophoresis of those DNA fragments, and we're going to combine that with something called nucleic acid hybridization. Now, what that means is that we are going to take the DNA sample that we have right here, and you can see this in the diagram, and we are going to do the same process we had done before. We're going to use gel electrophoresis to separate the DNA on this gel, but what we're going to do next is we're going to take that separated DNA and we're going to transfer it over to a membrane. And once we have that membrane, we're going to see something that somewhat looks like this. So then what we're going to do is we're going to take specifically labeled um, nucleotide sequences with these radioactive probes and we're going to expose them to the membrane. And so the inclination is that these particular DNA fragments that are found on this membrane, since they are single-stranded, are going to want to complementary base pair with these, again, radioactively labeled nucleotide sequences. And so the, once they do that, when you expose this on film, what you're going to find is you're going to be able to identify those particular sequences on your membrane. Now, sometimes what we need to do is we need to study expression of interacting groups of genes. And so what's really nice is a lot of what we're talking about now has been automated. And so this has allowed scientists to measure the expression of thousands and thousands of genes at one time. And one method of doing that is something called a DNA microarray assay. And so this is going to be used to compare the patterns of gene expression in different tissues at different times, or it could even be tissues that are under different conditions. And so a good example of this would be the diagram that you see right here. And so in this case, we're going to be comparing a normal cell with a cancer cell. And our idea is that we want to see when is that gene actually expressed. And so we're going to take each of those, we're going to culture each of these cells. We are going to isolate the RNA, so we're going to isolate the messenger RNA, but we're going to use something called reverse transcriptase. Now, when you use reverse transcriptase, what you're trying to create is you're trying to create what you see right here, and that's going to be our cDNA. 
The C stands for complementary DNA. So we're just trying to create a complementary DNA strand from that messenger RNA, and that's why it's considered reverse transcription. And so what we're going to do next is we're going to add some um, fluorescent probes to each of these different samples. So the normal is going to fluorescence, in this case green. And so in this case, the one that actually has a gene that is expressed in the cancer cell is going to um, fluorescence red. And so each type of cell is going to have a different probe. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take each of these different samples and you're going to expose them to a microarray plate. And so this microarray plate could have lots and lots of different tissue types. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to see when is this gene actually expressed. And you know it's being expressed because it's going to complementary base pair with a single strand of that sample. And so over here on the right, once we do a scan of this particular plate, you're going to come up with lots of different colors. And so if you notice based on our key, basically if you have the gray, which is this right here, that's going to indicate that that particular gene is not going to be expressed in those cells. If you have yellow, that means it's going to be expressed in both those cells. If you have green, that means that gene is going to be expressed only in normal cells, but if you have red, that means that whatever's being expressed in those cancer cells is going to be expressed in those disease cells. So it's going to allow you to make a comparison between, as we had said, lots of different tissue types, lots of different gene expressions, maybe at one time, seeing how they interact with each other, and do a very thorough analysis of that genetic material. All right, so that's going to finish up our screencast for Chapter 20, and as always, please make sure that you have completed your screencast study guide.